in 1516, the Sultan, which is the Turkish ruler, Salim Harishon, the first Salim, who was known as Hamid, the brave one, for whatever reason, he conquered the land of Israel. What you see here in green is the conquering of the Ottoman, Ottoman, right? Ottoman. 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 Okay, the Ottoman Empire up to 1520. What you see here in green is Syria, Egypt, <coughs> and this is how it's, the empire started. The next after him was. Sultan, the Sultan Salim, which uh, Suleiman was also known as Hamefuar, the glamorous one. I bet it's because of the hat. <laughs> Have you seen anything like that? There's, there's, a, there's a black guy walking around this area with a huge hat like that, but doesn't get any clothes. Really. That was him. In his time, like Queen Elizabeth I, was a, an era of prosperity, science, and knowledge. Uh, at the Turkish Empire. This man had a variety of interests, which was, he spoke Persian, he spoke Arabic, okay? He knew mathematics, music, he was a bowman, he knew how to use a bow and an arrow to, in, in, in an excellent way, and he, was, he also knew how to make jewelry. That's another thing he used to do. And he was a very, uh, quite a good man, actually. This is uh, the Tower of David in Jerusalem and, this, and the, the walls of the old walls of Jerusalem. He is responsible for the building of these walls. That's his doing. And he became, he came to power in 1520, after his father, Salim Rishon, died. He was married to a woman, to a woman named Oksalna. Don't have a picture of her, but they say she was a real witch. <laughs> What I found in the book says she was a horrible person, but she had a lot of influence on him. I don't know how to reconcile the two facts that uh, she was a witch, but he was a good man, but somehow it worked. Obviously and, it's a trap. <laughs> and in his time, and in his time, the Jews in Eretz Israel had quite a good time. No, no special pressure, nothing special was going on for them. It was a quiet time. You know, uh, the expression, uh, no news is, uh, is good news. That was the case. Of them. I have to, uh, Palestine. Yeah, what you see here is the what is known in Hebrew Brechot Sultan, the um, the pools of the Sultan, which he built and was named after him in his honor. Okay, now we have to, to. I need the number. To. Okay. Okay, I'll manage. Okay. But at his time already, when he was the Sultan, when he was the ruler, the troubles began early in the 17th century. Um, this is a, a drawing of um, Janichar, or Janichar actually called Janichar soldier. This was the elite, this is the commando, this is the elite, the special forces of the Turkish army, and, but they were paid pretty well. And they were not happy with how much they were paid. So the discipline was breaking down um, at, uh, already at the time of Suleiman Amifuar, the great Suleiman. But on the 17th century, it was also time when Istanbul became more powerful. So they overcome the problems, but the whole history of the uh, Ottoman Empire is a story, story of instability. Between 1832 to 1840, it was the only time when the Turkish, the Turks did not rule at the at, uh, at, uh, at Palestine at the land of Israel. And Muhammad Ali, who was the sheriff of, uh, of Egypt at the time, he took over. But with the help of the British and the French people at the time, this is a whole story of politics with, which we're not going to get into. Um, the Turks got back the power in Eretz Israel. And again, Jews enjoyed relatively quiet life. Jews in uh, Eretz Israel, especially in Jerusalem, they were interested in one thing, and that was religion. religion. No politics, nothing. Just one thing: 
they were interested in religion. Anyone who made an aliyah to Eretz Israel, they came because they wanted to be in the Holy, Holy Land. Uh, it sounds sad, but many of them came to die in the Holy Land and be, and, and, and be buried in the, in the mountains of Jerusalem. That's the only interest they had, and as long as the Jews were not interested in politics, everything was very quiet and very pleasant, there were no problems. You want to say something? No? Oh, okay. You see here, the streets of, of Yerushalayim. Most of the people you see here are Muslims. As long as there was a Muslim majority in Jerusalem, there were really no problems at all. This is a Shah Yafo, the Jaffa Gate. And you see most of the people here are Muslims. I'm not sure about this particular guy here. But most of these people are Muslim and everything was very quiet. The Turkish people are Muslims. Remember? Here you see them on the on the on the Temple Mount. So the Muslim Turkish with the with the Arab uh, Muslims in in Eretz Israel, they really had no problems with each other. But things changed at at the end of the 19th century, when a group called Chovevei Tzion started to make an aliyah to Eretz Israel. That's early 19th century. And they built, uh, they started to get out of the walls of Jerusalem because it was too crumpy and there was no space and they couldn't live this way. And they built a place called Mishkenot Shahanim. Today when you go to Jerusalem, you pay a couple of millions of dollars, that's where you can buy a house. But no less than a couple of millions of dollars, extremely expensive. This is instead the, the famous uh, windmill that everybody knows today about it, but you've seen that, and they build it. And this is a... Uh, anybody recognize this guy? That's Theodor Herzog. With a group of Kovitzion who made Aliyah uh, to Eretz Israel at the end of the 19th century, and uh, with all due respect to Herzog, which I do have, he did not invent Zionism. They did. He just m moved it into a, a diplomatic level, which they didn't, uh, didn't do. Then comes the Aliyah Rishona, the first Aliyah, the first way of, uh, way of immigration, when the population of Eretz Israel actually nearly doubled from 26,000 to 55,000 souls. And that was the beginning of troubles. Because suddenly there are more Jews, and these Jews did not come to Eretz Israel to pray. They did not come to Eretz Israel <coughs> to die there. They came to be <coughs> farmers. Most of them, by the way, more religious than I. Very free people, ultra-orthodox in our understanding today. Um, they came to Eretz Israel to build it. Why they did that, the story behind that, that was in the course last year. But suddenly the, the Turks in, in Eretz Israel see that there's a new, something new is happening. And what's the first fear, the first worry that they develop? Take over. That they take over, exactly. Rebellion, quiet rebellion, armed rebellion, whatever. That they take over. So they started making life very, very difficult for the uh, for the newcomers. Okay. There was something called the red settle, the red uh, paper, or the rote quitto in Yiddish or in, 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 in German. Um, everything that a new immigrant, someone who made a liang, came to Israel to build it, wanted to do, had to be authorized by the Turkish people, by the Turkish uh, authorities, and there was a little kind of a, of a red uh, piece of paper which the authorization was written on and signed. Anything that they wanted to do had to be authorized, and one thing was most difficult to get, and this is the permission to build a roof to your house. A roof to your house. Why? Because the roof symbolizes stability. You, can, you, know, you know, it's like the sukkah. The laws of sukkah, the Allah says that if you have two and a half walls, the sukkah is kosher. But you have to have the schach on top. Because, you know, whether it's open completely or half open, and, you know, as long as you have a cover to your head, you're fine. So, to get the permission to build a roof to a house was very difficult. This is the great synagogue of Zichon Yaakov. I took a picture myself, I used to be Chazan for, for six months before I came here. And when the Jews in Zichon Yaakov, which is right in the north, not far from Haifa, 
But when they wanted to build the synagogue, they went to the authorities and say, may we please build the synagogue? And the answer, of course, was, no, forget it. So after a few months, they came again and they said, may we please have permission to build stables for our horses? Oh yeah, stables for horses by all means, but no roof. Yeah, horses don't need roof, they don't care about rain. So they built this building. And they put straws on the floor. And they put some um, separations like you have in a stable. And they put some horses. And that was fine, but no, no, no roof. And one day, actually one night, within one night, everybody from the Moshava, from the settlement, lay their hand and they built the roof. Now, another interesting uh, Turkish law was that if you have a building with a roof, you can't, that's it, you cannot demolish it. You cannot demolish the building, you cannot demolish the roof. The law says this is a building and it has to stay. So the Turkish got up, went to bed one evening with, with a stable and they woke up in the morning with a synagogue. Okay. Unfortunately, there is a, there was a synagogue in Warsaw that the Germans, the Nazis, after they took over Warsaw in, 19, in September 1939, uh, they turned the synagogue into stables. Happened once, maybe more than once, that I, but I don't know. I know about one case. This was the reverse. Of course, the Turks, the, the Turks were very, very upset about it, but uh, that's the law. So when they wanted to give some troubles and, and, and persecute the, 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 uh, the people who lived in Zichon Yaakov, so, the, so uh, the, the Jews in Zichon Yaakov used the other law, which is the law of bakshish, bribery. You know the word? Mm -hmm. Bribery. You could buy anything you possibly wanted from the Turks with money. If you had enough money, you had anything you wanted. That was the law. And what? This is just one example. 1914 is when the First World War broke, and uh, most of the Jews living in Eretz Israel were foreigners in the country, mainly Russian citizens. Now, Russia was on the other side of the fence against uh, uh, Turkey at that war, so the, the Turks did whatever they could to make the, the life of those Russian Jews living in Palestine as miserable as possible. Um, they broke into houses and took whatever they wanted to take. They confiscated um, materials for fencing, to make fences from settlements. Uh, on the 17th of December 1914, it was known as Yom HaChamishia Shechor, the Black Thursday, when they stopped people, Jews in the street, and just put them on a ship and shipped them all the way down to, to Cairo, for no obvious reason. They also closed down Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv at the time was a little neighborhood outside northern to, to Yafo. And they just kicked everybody out with the uh, excuse that they are fifth column or spies or whatever they said. And what you see here is the people, uh, the residents of this little neighborhood called Tel Aviv sitting outside uh, of, the, of the little ne neighborhood. Uh, it's a well-known uh, painter named Nachum Gutman from Israel. He was the guy who was left to watch over the houses. He also he painted this drawing. You can, you can see here how the windows are closed and shut with uh, with uh, pieces of, uh, of, of wood. And also you can see the center of the street. You can see the animals. And he was telling that it's only the animals that were allowed to stay in Tel Aviv during the shutdown uh, uh, of the city. You see the animals here. This is the drawing, <coughs> very famous drawing. Um, the policy of the Turks was to persecute the Jews, smack them, hit them, torture them, do whatever they wanted with them. So at that time, the Jews in Palestine and Israel realized that we got to do something to get rid of the Turkish government, to get rid of them. At that time, also, information leaked into the country about the murder of the Armenian people, which everybody know about that. Many, many hundreds of thousands of Armenians were murdered, slaughtered by the, by the Turkish. Um, and the persecutions, uh, sorry, the murder of the Armenian people started exactly the same way. Persecutions, being nasty towards them, hitting them, torturing them, taking away their property. So, so the Jews in Eretz Israel said, whoa, 
That's what's happening to us now. We're going to be the next in the line. This guy, and you're going to see a lot of him tonight, Avshalom Feinberg, or in short, Avshalom, <coughs> wrote a letter to this woman, Henrietta Sold. Some of you have heard of her, an, an American activist. Uh, he says, because they, he wrote to her, because they will not dare slaughter us all at, all at once together, they will execute us in pieces, one by one. Until we are out of our souls, uh, quietly lying in the mud. These things can be prevented only if we take measures now, even if they are not unusual measures, that will allow us later to act against the Turkish people, against the Turkish government, and in the right time. That's what he wrote to her. What, were her. what was her response? We don't know. And this is the man who is ultimately responsible for the, for the torturing and the killing, Jamal Pecha, who was the, uh, the, the, the Pasha, the, uh, the ruler of Eretz Israel at the time. Um, very elegant, I would say, good looking guy, but extremely evil inside of him. That's what he was. So this is the background to the story that I'm going to tell you now. To summarize it, the Turkish, the Turks in Eretz Israel are giving a hell of a time to the Jewish settlement and it's time to get rid of them. This is during the time of First World War. We all know that the British conquered the land of Israel during this war. That was the beginning of the British mandate of Eretz Israel. But it wasn't so clear, and the British did not take over Palestine for any Zionist reason. Yes, it's true that Chaim Weizmann told uh, Lloyd George and, and uh, James Arthur Balfour, what I want from you is to give, to give me a land for my people, when he helped them uh, in the war efforts. But everything else proceeded later. Now we are in a stage, in a, in a, in, in a stage where the 1915, this man, Aaron Aronson, and we just call him Aharon, simply in Hebrew. From now on, Aharon, who was an agronomist and a scientist, he was, he was born in Baku, in Romania, 1876, uh, to his parents, a fine official, and uh, this is a fine official, and this is his wife, Malka. And they made an aliyah in 1882, and they settled in Zirkon Yaakov. Uh, one was a very famous scientist, agronomist in his time. He found out, uh, he found many important species, including the, the, the they call it the mother of, of wheat, the original type of wheat. It was very important for <coughs> reasons. He actually had good relations with, with the Turkish uh, government at the beginning. He was uh, managing, running a, a farm in near Istanbul for the Turks, but at the, the, the year 19... 1900, um, he came back to Eretz Israel. In 1910, he he established the the experimental um, farm near Atlit, which is just down the cl the cliffs of Zichron Yaakov. And I know it's a small picture. That's what I could find. And this is part of the uh, entry to the to the to the farm. And he was fed up with the Turkish people, and he said, "We gotta do something about it." So he joined together with the men who assisted him. Again, this is Aaron, this is Aaron, again with Avshalom, who was his assistant. We'll talk, we'll say a few more words about Avshalom later. He joined with Avshalom, and they made an approach to the British army in Egypt, trying to convince them to take control of Palestine from the Turks. It was a grandiose, uh, you know, it's a fantasy plan. Imagine that I go to, to, to someone and say, listen, I would like you to conquer this land for me. What? What for? The only thing that the British already knew in the back of their heads that they would have to do it. Long before they actually planned it, they knew that for all kinds of reasons, and I'll explain to you later on the map why they had to do it, they knew that they would have to do it, so they, it was, the idea was running in their heads, but they did not take Aaron and Avshalom seriously. You know, two young boys from El Israel coming into, would come into Cairo and say, or, or Alexandria, why don't you conquer my land? Oh, it's ridiculous. But indeed, and 
in 19, in, in, on July, I think it was in July, when was it? On July, yes, July 1915, Rivka, which was the sister of Aaron, which I showed you just before, and her brother Alexander, they went into, they traveled to Egypt, they arrived there on the 8th of August 1915 to Alexandria to meet the British uh, uh, officers and try and, and convince them um, to take Aaron's idea to conquer, conquer Eretz Israel. While being there, Alexander wrote to the British reports about the situation in Israel, how the, the population is suffering, and the way that uh, the Turkish are behaving, and that the morale is very low in the army, trying to convince them it's not going to be difficult at all to, to conquer the land. But um, all these officers, just like you and me thought it was a ridiculous idea. Who are you to come and tell the great British Empire which country to conquer and which not? So they actually kicked them out and they ordered their, their deportation out of, out of Alexandria and by the 3rd of September 1915 they sailed uh, to the United States. A few days before they sailed, on the 30th of, uh, of October, sorry, 30th of August 1915, again, of Shalom, managed to sneak into Egypt and to arrive at uh, Cairo with a, a fake identity under the name of Hirsch Naronsky. And he finally met with one intelligence officer, not intelligent, not intelligent, intelligence officer named Leonard Wiley, a British officer, which sat down and seriously listened to Avshalom. And what Avshalom told him is what I just told you. You will have to, in the course of the war, take control of Eretz Israel for the reasons that he told him, told him and I'll show you later. <coughs> Why don't you accept help from us, the Jews who are suffering for the Turks, we're willing to, to do that, and he said, we don't want anything in return, nothing. All, I want, all we want from you is to get the Turks out of the country, and we will do all the work. And this guy, Wiley, listened to him, and he said, to him, okay, fine, let's make a deal. You supply, you, sorry, you collect all the information. He gave him a list of things he, not, he, need, he needed to know. I want you to tell me, sir, all the plans of the army, of the Turkish army in Eretz Israel, where are they? How many soldiers they have? What is the professional uh, level of these soldiers? Um, how good are their officers? You know, soldiers are only half as good as the officers are. Um, what is the economical situation in Eretz Israel? What is the influence of the economical in, uh, situation in Israel on the army? You know, if economy is bad, there's no food. There's no food. The army is, you know, what Napoleon said. The army is, marches on his stomach. And um, also, he said, two French pilots had to make an emergency landing near Be'er Sheva. Find out what happened with them. And there will be a ship named Saint Anne, and the ship Saint Anne will arrive to the shores, to the in front of the beach of Atlit, and will collect on all the information from you. So Shalom went back to Jerusalem after this great success. Before he went to Jerusalem, he stopped in Yafo and he met with Aaron. He reported to him and he said, okay, we have to start building up the net, the spine net, uh, and we have to start collecting information. So what I'm going to do, Shalom said to Aaron, I'm going now to Jerusalem because if I want to travel this time, if someone wanted to travel the area freely at any time, you have to get a special permission. But uh, logical and wartime that these kind of, uh, of, of certificates are needed. And while I'm, I'm in Jerusalem, I'll stay in the best hotel where all the Turkish officers are staying and I'll listen to what they talk and see what I can get out of them. The story is that he, Avshalom went up to Jerusalem and within three days he gathered a whole book, a whole notebook of information because the Turkish like to talk. And they talked, you know, between themselves. Completely irresponsible, in, irresponsible. Yes, ir irresponsibly, and he wrote everything. He was a very learned, educated man, I'll tell you about him later, uh, and in a few days he had information, a lot of information. Then Aaron and Shalom sat together with Alexander, again Alexander, Alexander is Aaron's brother, and said we need a name, code name for our group, 
and it shows the word Nili. Nili. And it's from this verse. And also the glory of Israel will not lie nor repent. It sounds much better in Hebrew. The gam netzoch Yisraelo yishaker, and if you look at the nun, nun, yud, lam, yud, this is Nili. Nili is also a feminine name in, in Hebrew. So it was easy to remember. The meaning of the verse is that no matter what happens to us, the Jewish people, we will always prevail and always survive. This is the meaning of this book, for, this verse from the book of Shuel, uh, Shuel 1. Um, so this is the beginning of Nili. We're going back to Avshalom, who is the very main character in our story. Avshalom was born in Gedera, which is at the south of the of, of, of Israel, in, in 1889. His parents were named Fanny and Israel Feinberg. Israel Feinberg was also known as Lolik, a very active man in, uh, in drying swamps and purchasing lands and, and assisting in building settlements in the, in the country. When he was two years old, they moved to Yafo, and Avshalom was sent to the Muslim school in Yafo. Which sounds funny to send a Jewish boy, but that was the good thing, because he learned the Quran, he learned Arabic, he could speak Arabic like an Arab person, which helped him a great deal in the, in the work later on, spying for the, uh, for the British. From there he learned, in the, from there he moved to a to, um, school called, named Kol Israel Chavirim, it's the name of the school, yes? Was there a choice at, the, at that time to go to the Hebrew schools? Or no. So, no. I mean, everybody that, to no, no, schools. sorry, actually, sorry, my mistake. This there was, was a choice, the choice he had is to go to Echeda. Okay. Which is Haredi, ultra orthodox, which his father Luli didn't want to send him. So his father preferred to send him to the Muslim. It was called Kutav. I think it's called Madrasa. Kutav. No, Madrasa is is, is a word for school, but yeah. they call it Kutav or Kitab, something like that. Um, so that was the choice he made. He preferred to send him to the Muslim Cheder rather than the ultra orthodox Cheder. Okay, but at that time, this was the time the British were there. No, no, no. Okay, that was good. that's way before that. When he was 12, by the way, he established with, the, uh, with a group of, uh, of children a movement called Nusei Degel Zion, the carriers of the Zionist flag. Very childish thing. The idea, the ideology, ideology of this group was to free the land of Israel from the Turkish. He was only 12. But this is, you know, a kind of... This. What are 12 people, 12, sorry, what are 12 year old kids doing today? Yeah, okay, you know. That was what, this is what uh, 12 years old did in those times. For they think about freedom. But it just shows about the way his head was so mature already and he was thinking about, about the future. When he was 14 and a half, he was sent to study in Paris. Um, from there he came back to Eretz Israel. He moved, he was a clerk in Egypt. He didn't like it, he moved to Switzerland. Believe it or not, from Switzerland he came back to Eretz Israel in 1909. And when Aharon opened the farm near Atlit, the farm I showed you before, he went uh, to uh, assist Aharon in his, uh, in, his, uh, in, his, in his in his scientific work, and he got friendly with the entire uh, uh, family, with Alexander, um, Aronson, and with Sarah, Sarah Aronson. We we don't really know what was the dynamic between uh, Avshalom, Sarah and uh, her sister Rivka. We don't know. What we do know is when Avshalom died, Rivka didn't marry. She said, I'm Avshalom's woman. She died in 1981. She was 90 something when she died. She never married. She remained faithful to him, and we, but we, just, we just don't know. On one hand, people, everybody, not everybody, everybody, sorry, everybody at the at Zikon Yaakov said that Avshalom was actually engaged to Rivka. But all the pictures and documents we have is of Shalom holding hands with Sarah. And we do know that Sarah loved him all her life. She spoke about it with a few people. But, okay, that's just uh, a side story. Soon after the uh, spying net uh, was established, this man joined Yosef Lishansky. Another person who joined the net was Naaman Belkin. His father was one of the founders of Chovevei Zion. And now the 
the group was completely active. Aharon started moving around, collecting information. <coughs> Aharon was collecting information. Um, Naaman and Yosef did the same. Avshalom did the same. They collected information about Haifa. What is the situation with the army in Haifa? And how many um, Turkish warships are coming in with supply and, and soldiers and so on? They uh, collect information about the stationing of the Turkish people, the Turkish <coughs> army at uh, Oshpina, which is all the way up to the, at the north of the country. And Avshalom carried on to collect information until one major problem occurred. Set Anne, the ship that was supposed to come from Cairo to Atlit to collect the information, and by now they have notebooks, many notebooks full of information, the ship didn't show up. What happened is that the ship actually arrived in front of the shores of Atlit. But somehow the, 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 the sailors did not know how to make proper contact with the people waiting on the beach. So they stayed one, one, one night and the following day, and then the, Turk, the Turks realized there's a ship, you know, docking, you know, docking there, which is not supposed to be there. So they started smelling, you know, what's going on around. So the ship turned back and sailed back to Cairo, and actually a um, Turkish officer came to the came to the to the farm where Aaron was working near Atli to ask some questions. So they gave him wine, which, by the way, the Turkish uh, not, were not supposed to. I think I think Muslims don't drink wine. Okay. Somehow they got him drunk, put a lot of money in his pocket, and sent him away. And that was the end of it. But there was no contact with the British. So what's the point if the group is, you know, collecting information all over, all over the Turkish Empire actually, because they travel all around, but there's no one to give the information to. So what's the point? So Avshalom decided that he is taking a camel and he's trying to cross Sinai Desert. I wouldn't try to do this with a car or if I, if I had. He, he was willing to do this on the back of a camel. So he went through to, um, I think I have a picture of that. Okay, so Aaron, sorry, uh, Avshalom with another friend named Ephraim. Avshalom was riding a camel, Ephraim was riding a horse. Remember that, that's important. Avshalom was on a camel, Ephraim was on a horse. They left Khadera, where they lived. They did all the way down to Gaza city. From there they moved to Be'er Sheva. And from there, they moved to El Arish. I don't know why they didn't go straight like that. There's no explanation, but they did like that. When they stopped at El Arish, they went into the house of the commanding officer, the Turkish commanding officer of El Arish, just to know, show some respect, and they thought it would be less suspicious if we show up. What was the excuse for the trip? You know what you see? This is not the This is... Pyramids, but this is this was this picture was taken in, in yeah, that's right in Egypt uh, near the pyramids. But what the, what you see in the air is locust. Locust. Lo, lo, sorry. Locust. locust. Sorry. Uh, 1915. There was a you know like the the one of the plagues of Egypt. Incredible plague of uh, locusts, um, which literally destroyed the economy of the Red Sea, and everybody were fighting that. So. So uh, Shalom and Ephraim pretended to be two scientists traveling to mm -hmm. see what could we do to fight this plague. So they visited the officer in El Arish, they stayed with him, they slept uh, in, uh, as his guest uh, that night. The following day, they took the horse and the camel and tried to start crossing the desert this direction. But in less than a day, they realized that they have a problem. Shalom was fine on the camel. For camel to to go through the desert, easy easy, no problem. But a horse it doesn't work that way. So the horse was battling the poor animal. The fire was slow, and they realized we're never going to make it. 
So Shalom said to Ephraim, he said, you go back. I'll carry on. So Ephraim went back from, as far as he got from El Arish, back to El Arish, and who does he meet on the way in? The Turkish officer. I'm back. Oh, wait a minute. You just said you're a scientist on your way to Egypt, you're your friend, to fight the lo locusts, right? Locus. The locusts. Where's your friend and why are you back here? So he started to explain this and I made a mistake. I took a horse instead of a camel. But the officer didn't buy the story, so it was something suspicious. And he sent a, a, a unit of army and they caught up Shalom and brought him back. Started asking questions and of Shalom realizing what's going on, he got rid of all these fake papers and ideas. And, you know, to cut this story shorter, they put him in the Be'er Sheva jail. Because they didn't believe him. Something's wrong with him. So, Avshalom went out, trying to reach Egypt to make the contact with the British. He didn't make it. During his uh, vacation at the jail, Avshalom kept contact with the outside world with the help of Yosef and Naaman. So they were now, these two were not collecting information waiting for Nidhi, they were actually trying to get the information that he had and some were writing it down because most of the material he remembered by heart and try and find another way to transfer the information. So this is Sarah, when she was a little girl. She was born on 6th of January 1880 in Zilkon Yaakov. She studied at the uh, school of Zilkon Yaakov. Grew up really nicely. A lady will say she was, and was extremely clever because with the little uh, education she managed to get in that school, she managed to learn German and French, and fr and French on her own. I don't know, I don't know French, I, I do know German. German is extremely complicated. She managed to do that on her own. <coughs> she was she was very clever. What did she do after school? Like a good girl, she stayed home, helped her parents. When Malka, her mother died, she stayed with her father. And she worked with Aaron at the, at the, at the farm, helping him. 1914, Sarah married this man, Chaim Avraham, a Bulgarian businessman, quite successful, who lived in Istanbul, of all places. She married him. Um, what he, we know she was still very much in love with Avshalom, but Avshalom probably belonged to the sister Rivka. And he was a gentleman, he was a good man, he was really a good man. He offered her security. Uh, one of the stories that I read is that she told him the truth. I will always respect you, but I love someone else. But he accepted that. They got married and they moved to Istanbul. This is a later uh, picture when he looks a bit older. No, 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 no beard, as you see. And while she was living with Chaim in Istanbul, it is now wartime, like I said before, the Turks are given a really hard time to the issue, to the Jews in Eretz Israel, and she's starting to get letters from her sister Rivka, and there's something funny in the letters, and one line in the letter suggests, I know you always like to collect stamps, but she never did. So take off the stamps of the envelope and collect them. She realizes it's a message. So she took off the stamps from the envelope, and under the stamps there was a little message in handwriting which is telling a whole different story to what was inside the letter. Inside the letter it was wonderful, we had a party, we had a ball, we had this and we had that. It was bought a new dress and renovated the house. Under the stamp was the true story, we're suffering, we're starving. They took uh, taking anything away from us, they beat us, there's no more money for bribery, it's terrible. And Sarah keeps getting this information from home. At a certain point, she starts fighting with Chaim. I want to go back to my family. I can't stand it. On one of his trips, just before we went into one of his trips into Europe uh, for business, he said to her, you know, Sarah, you're very stubborn. I can't take it anymore. You want to go? Go. But promise me you'll come back. He said, I will come back. And she traveled. It took her, th took her three weeks to travel to Eretz Israel. She used carriages, horses, trains, and the story she told when she came home is at one of the stops of the train, she saw a Turkish soldier shooting an Armenian woman and, and then shooting the baby. 
and she screamed at him, what are you doing? He said, what do you want? Just an Armenian dog. So it's one, one less Armenian in, in the world. It's a good thing. This was the story. This is the, uh, the, the, the thing she witnessed and she brought home with her. She came into the family house, showing a picture later, which was a very glamorous, beautiful house. And the house was dirty, it was a mess, it was, you know, the poverty was all over. And the Aronson family was uh, no, not rich, not wealthy, but they had enough for themselves. Suddenly they had nothing. And the story says that the father meets her at the gate and starts yelling to Sarah, what are you doing here? I had one peace of mind in my life that you are safe in Istanbul with your husband. What are you doing here? Why did you come for heaven's sake? And she said that I couldn't stay any longer. You think I can be safe and happy with my husband in Istanbul when I know what's happening here? She couldn't take it. And she cleaned the house. She managed to get some food and cooking and did whatever she had to do in the, in, in the house. And then she sits down in the evening and Aaron is speaking with Yosef Kishansky. And Aaron has, get, has a slip of the tongue. He says one thing which he shouldn't have said in the presence of Sarah because they didn't want Sarah involved in this business. It was a risky business. And she called him and she said, what did you say? What is this all about? And she kept on pressing on him until he told her the truth. Yes, we are operating a, a network of, uh, of intelligence and we are collecting information and we are going to transfer the information to the British. And she says immediately when she sees, okay, she still has the vision of the Armenian slaughter on the way. And she said to Aaron, I want to be part of it. And he tried to persuade her, Sarah, don't do this. It's not for women. It's dangerous. There's nothing you can do. Anything that can be done is already done. But she didn't let go. So he let her into, into the work. Another man that uh, joined the, uh, um, the network at the time was uh, Luba, what is uh, Luba Schnellson. Let's say Luba Schnellson. I'm not showing you more pictures of more members because I couldn't find the pictures, but there were plenty of new other, uh, of other there was a, between 25 to 30 people in this whole net, you know, this network of, of spying. And um, actually, a few days, sorry, short, short few weeks after Sarah came back home, everyone decided that he needs to try and establish again the contact with the British and he decides to try and get uh, through uh, to Europe and from there to, to England. They had a lot of information. Absalom was released from the from prison but again there was no way to transfer the information so Aaron goes on the journey and he travels to Germany from Germany, Germany to Copenhagen in Copenhagen, he made contact with the British ambassador that believed him. And the British ambassador put him on a boat, on a ship sailing to the United States, but in the, they had one stop in Scotland, and in Scotland, Aaron took off the boat, and he was taken to London, and he met with the British officers in London, and he gave him on the spot so much information that they were really forced to believe him. And they referred him to, to, to Major Walter Gribben, and made sure Walter Gribben worked now together with Aaron. Yes. So can I interrupt you just yes. for a second? I just have a question. First yes. of all, how, were they, how did they finance all their travels? Sorry, how did they? They finance all their travels to all these countries that they had no money and nothing, and the Turks weren't allowing them to hold anything. Second of mm -hmm. all, when they were over hearing all the conversations and doing all the spy networking, they all spoke fluent Turkish, or all the Turkish officers spoke Arabic together? Okay, they all spoke fluent Turkish and Arabic. Okay, I think Turkish and Arabic, I, I don't know enough about them, but apparently they, they knew the languages. Um, how did they finance? It's a question I was asking myself today. I know one thing, Aaron was a very well-respected scientist, and he made, probably made, a, made, a, made a, a decent income. And, and, the, and the Feinberg family, uh, Avshalom's family was also well, well, did very well in Russia before they came to Earth Israel. And also remember, 
that money from Jew Jews in Russia kept pouring into Eretz Israel during all that time to, to help. And the freedom to travel in and out all the time, that was not enough. Aaron was a very respectable man. Mm -hmm. And remember, he had this uh, farm in, in near Istanbul before he moved back to Eretz Israel. So uh, to, up to a certain time, it was easy for him to travel. He could actually get all these things done. About the financing, I can only uh, assume that the money came from Russia, like, like the money came to support the Aliyah Rishona, Chorvei Sion, they all needed that money because Eretz Israel was very poor. This is my assumption as far as I, I, can, I can remember. Why would they send him to, to, uh, to the United States? Because, because, because uh, no, it stopped there. But why he was no, on the boat? No, 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 him no, to the no. He nobody sent him to United States. He decided on his own to say that he's going to United States oh. uh, f because because the um, because Jews Amer so because American Jews financed the farm near Atlet. So it would make a reasonable uh, excuse why you're going now to the states because I need to talk to my sponsors. So that was the excuse. Oh, was but actually, he didn't go to the states. He went to Germany. Okay. From Germany okay. to Copenhagen, from Copenhagen to London. He, okay, and he wasn't in the, the States at that time. It was just okay. a cover up. Okay. And, okay. And, yes? and you were saying there were warships. There was a, there was a ship in, in the harbor there, and we didn't know what it was about. But there was warships there from Turkey. Now, at the Haifa harbor, there were warships nah, from Turkey. I, I'm trying to get my mind around this. The warships, they were at war with. With Russia at the time, or why were there more? But but was they at war with Britain also? The Turkey, the, 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 Turkey and Russia Britain were war? Turkey and Russia were in world war for many many years. Okay, but Britain was part of that too. Britain uh, and France. So why wouldn't they want to conquer Israel? But that was all part of Turkey, wasn't it? The, yeah, so the, why the, was the there British a question about conquering Israel? Or, um, it wasn't, I'll tell, you know, let's get okay. ahead because I have those maps to explain exactly, uh, the, we're actually getting there soon, to explain what the British were thinking. Uh, the bottom line was to no, not to go into battle for something that we don't need. Okay, the, like I said at the beginning, uh, so many British officers knew that eventually we will have to go through and decide we, have, we will have to conquer, but there was no set policy at the time. To really do that. No, but apparently it seems to me that, that, that the Turks were prepared for for something because they had Yeah, the but the warships. British didn't really care who's who's really, who's, who's controlling Eretz Israel at, at the beginning. The oh, office, some officers knew that we will have to take control, but uh, but you know it's just, it's a tiny little place. They didn't really care much about that. So where was I? Um, so. Okay, I'm at a point when Aaron is meeting a major. Walter uh, Ribbon, and he's in charge of the Turkish affairs in the uh, in the British uh, uh, intelligence. He made the report, he gave all the information, and he was really convincing. So the British put him on a on a warship named Karmala, and he's sailing now to to Cairo. And in Cairo, he meets with the with the with the responsible uh, <coughs> intelligence officers. And now the contact between Lily and the British is made, and there's a decision made that a warship named Manningham, I'll show you a picture later, Manningham will say once a month, <coughs> you know, at the end of the month when there's no moon, and they will uh, harbor in front of the fleet, and someone will take with a little, little boat, come to shore, and take all the information and go back, and this is what's going to be, and it really actually worked just like that. That's how it worked. In the meantime, because there were no cell phones, and no telegrams, Avshalom didn't know that Aaron was successful in London and in Cairo. So he decided on his own initiative, again, to take a camel and try and cross the desert into Egypt and make the contact, and he takes Yosef Lishansky with him. And together they go out, but on the way they were attacked by a group of 30 or 40 Bedouins, it's called in English, Bedouins. Yosef was badly injured, he was taken to Port Said into by, by uh, an Australian unit, from there to a, a hospital in Cairo, Afshalom was killed. And he was buried in the sands, and for many years nobody knew what happened to Afshalom, because Afshalom was killed after Yosef was, was injured. In the meantime, Aaron, Aaron, is, Aaron is, at, is in Cairo, Afshalom is gone, Yosef Fishansky is 
in hospital. Now Man Belkin is collecting information in the, in the south. Other members of at least of, of Mili are collecting the information all over the country and the and the British uh, sorry and the Ottoman Empire. And Sarah is alone with her old father at Zichon Yaakov, and she is now responsible of receiving information, the information, coding the information, and going down once a month to the farm in Atli, and from there to the shore, lying for a few nights in the middle of the month, waiting for Menachem to arrive and give information. She's taking this huge risk, and she's doing this all on her own. And this is, this is Manikham. It's a picture I took at the uh, Amundsen house in Zichon Yaakov in, in the museum. Couldn't find a better one. This is Manikham. Doesn't look too bad for a first world war ship. And now we're going to talk about the map, like we said now. Okay. This is Egypt and Sudan which are under control of the British Empire. Okay. Sinai Desert <coughs> is also under control of the British. But as the war progressed, the Turks actually managed to push the British all the way behind Suez, Suez Canal. Now, I don't have to tell you how important the Suez Canal is for merchandise, transferring materials, war efforts. So the British realized that they need to make contact. They need to make contact with the French in Syria. That's a whole different story. We won't get into that. <coughs> and they realized the need to protect the Suez Canal. So at the end of 1916, they make the decision: we have to take Eretz Israel. Okay. That is when when they really understand that they really have to. Now Eretz Israel. Why do you think over centuries there were so many battles and fights over this little piece? I'm not talking about Israel, but the Palestinian conflict today, which is something else. Because for centuries, this was known in Hebrew as Derech Hayam, the seaway. You go here by the shore, and this is the best way to reach Syria and all this southern, sorry, uh, uh, northern area. Of the, middle, of the Middle East. <coughs> this is why Eretz Israel has always been a connecting route, an extremely important one. That's why so many armies over so many centuries fought to have this, this, uh, this, uh, this piece of land. So now that the British have decided that they need to take control of Eretz Israel, the importance of Mili rises ten times. And it's very important. So Neely is providing information that the British now really do need. Until now, it was just to plan in case we have to do it and we're ready. Now it's really important and it's becoming even more important because when the British decided that they are going to, they will have to take over the land uh, uh, of the Earth Israel, they attacked twice through Gaza Strip, which is right here, okay, near, near the sea, and they failed twice. It didn't help them to have a tank. Which was the secret weapon? I mean, this is the this is the first this is the Mark One. If you remember, uh, a bit destroyed, I guess, but that's the picture I found. Um, it didn't help them. So now they really need information, and Aaron and Sarah are providing the information about the fortifications, where exactly are the water wells, which is highly important, and now the British are also listening to Aaron who says, forget about your horses, camels please, use camels. And then now the British are establishing the Royal Camel Battalion. Chel Hagmalim Hamalchuti, for those of you who understand Hebrew, the Royal Camel Battalion. And Allenby, General Edmund B. Allenby, is recruiting more soldiers and more camels and he's putting back all the tanks, we don't need them, and then also the, uh, what's this one? And then they make, they make the decision based on what Aaron provided. Aaron provided that there are more water wells in this area rather than that area. This is Gaza, and this is Beersheba. Now, why would the British 
attack through Gaza. Why here? You don't really need military mind for that. Shortest route. It's the shortest route. No, the water actually are here. But this is much easier surface to march on. Right? This is a desert. These are sands. So the British tried once to go in the, let's call it the more traditional warfare uh, 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 strategies and go through the easier path. They didn't work because the Turkish knew that this is a better route, so it was well defended. 